everyone. Hello from Singapore. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for our webinar on the future of holistic integrated care organized by SG Innovate and Nordic Innovation House. My name is Jody from SG Innovate and for those of you who may be more new to us, SG Innovate is a Singapore government-owned organization that invests in and builds deep tech startups, talent and community. Today, healthcare systems are undergoing dramatic transformation and technology is an enabler for achieving holistic integrated care opportunities. We have brought together a specific panel of experts from both Singapore and Nordic region to discuss about the future of holistic integrated care, such as how the approach aims to be multidisciplinary and how technology innovations are involved in future-ready integrated systems. Without further ado, I would now like to pass the time over to our event partner, Jacqueline, from the Nordic Innovation House for a quick opening remarks before then passing the time over to our moderator, Dr. Monica Mittal. Jacqueline, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie. I'm the Community Manager at Nord Innovation House Singapore. So thank you, Jody uh, and SG Innovate for giving us this opportunity. So just a brief background about Nord Innovation House. We are a community platform accelerating high quality Nordic tech startups, scale ups and growth companies uh, in various regions. So we are actually supported by Nordic Innovation. Uh, we are a unique collaboration between the five Nordic countries, which is Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland. We also have a presence in Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo, providing a global network and framework to, to serve the local ecosystem needs. So if you'd like to find out more, more about us, please visit our website uh, at nordicinnovationhouse.com. So in Singapore, our team consists of the Embassy of Finland, Innovation Norway, Business Iceland, Business Sweden, and also the Embassy of Denmark. So if you'd like to contact us for partnership, collaboration, and, or to find out more about us, feel free to drop me an email. And of course, follow our social media or subscribe to our newsletter for more information about Nordic ecosystem. So now I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Monica, who will be moderating the session. Thanks, Jacqueline. And thanks, Jody. I would first like to uh, thank SG Innovate and Nordic Innovation team to put such an amazing webinar and distinguished panels together. Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Monica Mittal, and I would be the moderator for today's session for title The Future of Holistic Integrated Care. What is integrated care? According to WHO, integrated care is a concept bringing together inputs, delivery, management and organization of services related to diagnosis, treatment, care, rehabilitation, and health promotion. In other words, it means to improve services in relation to access, quality, user satisfaction, and efficiency. During COVID times, we have seen, we have moved a step forward in bringing healthcare services, integrated healthcare services, of course, with the help of technology, innovative technology solutions. But what will the future hold? Let's hear it from a distinguished panel today. I would now like to invite Dr. Ivan Chung uh, to introduce himself and maybe describe in one word of how he feels to discuss today's topic. Thanks, Monica. Thanks for this opportunity. I am very happy to be here. I'm Dr. Irvin Chung, a family physician from National Healthcare Group Polyclinics. Uh, I work mainly in the areas of training and uh, up to the end of last year, I was also leading in the Innovation Strategy Trust that uh, we embarked on back in 2018. Uh, I will soon be head of a new polyclinic up north and I uh, hope that it will be an opportunity for us to test their new innovations as we continue to grow and develop family medicine to meet the needs of our aging population. Uh, to me, innovation is opportunity and um, uh, there's only excitement that, that that they can offer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ivan. Uh, I would also like to invite the, uh, I, I like to let the audience know that uh, one of our panelists, baby, could not make it. Unfortunately, she has taken ill. So uh, we have um, Riku Makela, uh, Counselor Innovation and Trade from Embassy of Finland, who has agreed to step in last minute and his thoughts would be very invaluable. Why uh, may I invite Riku to introduce himself and describe in one word about how he feels joining the session today? Monica, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a 
pleasure to be here and uh, tell something about Dr. Paivi, who wasn't able to make it because she got complication on the last minute, so she lost her voice like six hours ago, but she didn't have COVID, it was some other flu or cold which is going on in the Nordics because we usually get in wintertime all these colds. So then I was able to step in. I've been uh, collaborating with Paivi many times, uh, heading delegations in different countries and uh, my background is more in innovation side of healthcare. So I've, I've been in healthcare industry uh, a long time ago, and then I've been supporting Finnish healthcare system level innovation activities back in Finland uh, through funding, public funding and such. And then I've been heading knowledge transfer between the Nordics and different countries where I've been based in Vietnam, India, US, now in Singapore. Pleasure to be with you here. Thank you. Thank you, Rikula. It's a pleasure. Uh... Thank you, Riku. It's a pleasure to have you here. May I now invite um, Baldu Johnson, Vice President International Business at DNB Imatics, to introduce himself and share about how he feels this, joining the session. Hello. Thank, thank you, Monica. I'm, I'm Baldu Johnson. Um, I've been in the healthcare IT industry for the last probably 30 some years. Uh, worked across both healthcare providers. CIO of an academic medical center, uh, run healthcare um, services, um, IT services globally for large multinational uh, organizations, and most recently uh, been been um, working with Imatis to expand their business uh, across the globe. Imatis is a is a software business uh, located in Norway supporting an overall more efficient and effective delivery of healthcare services in hospitals and other healthcare environments with better communications, digitalization and orchestration. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today uh, and then share ideas and, and discuss the future state of integrated care. Thank you, Baldo. May I now invite Dr. Philip Wong, CEO and Chief Medical Officer at Spider ECG at Web Biotechnologies, to introduce himself and Good also afternoon. share how he feels <laughs> joining the session. Good afternoon, Monica. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Philip Wong. I'm a cardiologist and I used to practice in the academic uh, center and have moved out uh, recently to uh, enter into private uh, uh, practice. Um, I started a company uh, initially to try and make a diagnostic test, a simple diagnostic test called the Halter ECG a bit easier, uh, but then realized that, you know, when we could use uh, um, a new generation of uh, communications through the handphones and through the internet to transfer information, it made life simpler for a lot of uh, people. I think this uh, issue of integrated care is very pertinent now. Uh, you know we are facing a big challenge now with COVID and that brings a big barrier to uh, patients uh, seeing uh, doctors. Uh, and one of the issues uh, as a doctor that we face very commonly is that we have so much information coming in and uh, information is coming in from all over the place. It's not uh, put together in a way that our uh, you know, mind can really analyze the data to uh, create the best uh, treatment or management for the patient. So I think this forum is very, very interesting to see how in the present light of the COVID uh, uh, challenge, uh, how we can help to uh, integrate uh, information in a way that is much better for the management of patients. Very happy to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, all the panelists. Now, since we have started, I am very, very keen, firstly, to understand the Nordic healthcare ecosystem because it's globally renowned for providing cost efficient and high quality healthcare. So, Riku, would you be uh, would you be willing to share a little bit more about Nordic healthcare innovation system and how what are the key policies that have made it the cost efficient system? Well, thank you. Actually, there are so many aspects that we could discuss here <laughs> because this is so big topic. So you mentioned the kind of definition of integrated 
health or integrated care. And actually that definition was missing so many parts. For example, in many countries, we talk about social services, which are not health services, but they are crucial for prevention and many other activities. So that said, in the Nordics, one of our strengths for a long time has been that we have approached these questions holistically. So that we have tried to integrate different approaches so that the social services, health services, different actors come together to plan these things. And then what we have in all of the countries we have had and currently we have important strategies in place and roadmaps in place for how to move forward in holistic matter in each of the countries. So that's kind of a key there. So there has to be strategy and roadmap for how to move forward together. And then just to touch on one point, which is really crucial for any of these things to happen in integrated matter is data. So we need to have access to all health and social data somehow. So for example, in Finland, how it's organized is that 100% electronic medical records coverage and our model is based on central database that all different systems, and we have more than 10 different systems by different vendors and so on, but all the uh, health record systems access that central storage where key data about each person is there. And it's social data, it's health data, it's wellness data, it's self-reported wellness data and so on. So that's one of the crucial elements. And in the Nordics, we are in really good stage on that side. And most of the countries of the world are still moving towards first stage of having the data managed somehow and shared. Maybe that brings, you know, that's a very good insight that you share that uh, people are willing to share data. Maybe uh, I would like to hear from Philip Wong how he's being a cardiologist and he, he now also runs um, a medical device company, how does he feel about data sharing? Are patients and doctors willing to share that data? Like I'm, I'm amazed at Nordic innovation, how like in Finland people are willing to share that data um, by themselves. How does he deal with the challenge in this part of the world? Uh, it's a big challenge, you know, as uh, medicine has improved, uh, we need a lot more information from tests from the patients and from the social aspect as well, who's caring for the patient and, and so on. Uh, and to have it all in front of you uh, in a computer screen uh, when you consult the patient is really the issue we have now. We have this bombardment of information that is coming from uh, various sources. And of course, one of the steps that uh, Riku uh, mentioned, you know, having a consolidated database is definitely, or in an EMR, is a way to go. Uh, somewhere somewhere uh, where a physician or the patient can resource uh, all his consolidated data together. Uh, and of course, if we can have a, uh, you know, consolidated uh, a data, it means we have a more holistic picture of the patient and of course, a better understanding of, um, uh, of the patient and how to move ahead with the patient. Now, the, the issue is always how do we consolidate the data? Uh, I think that's the main uh, problem we have. Even in our small country in Singapore, uh, you know, Irwin is actually from another cluster in Singapore. And unfortunately, uh, my academic center, I came from the other cluster. And in between clusters, we actually had quite a history of having a difficulty of transferring the data uh, in a small population from one to another. We have, you know, largely, uh, you know, managed to solve it. But it took quite a lot of time. It, it took five to six years just to solve a simple uh, problem like that. So if we could, you know, sort of look at how we can move ahead and uh, like Rico uh, mentioned, how we can have a you know, holistic roadmap on how we can consolidate the data for patients. I think this would be uh, uh, something that would be very interesting. I, I, I hear in France, uh, for example, uh, actually a lot of the patient's data is actually consolidated on a card. So the patient actually carries his own consolidated data on a smart card that he can carry around. And of course, a, a physician can always uh, load it into his computer and then see the entire database. This may make it uh, much easier uh, for physicians, for example. That's, that, that's interesting sharing. Um, and may, maybe I would like to hear from uh, Dr. Ivan Chung of how he thinks of data sharing challenges in, in Singapore. And uh, also Singapore is known for three beyonds from hospital, from healthcare to health, 
from hospital to community and from quality to value. And he's been working with polyclinics for quite some time of how he has seen these three beyonds being integrated into the healthcare ecosystem in Singapore. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Good questions, actually. Um, and I echo uh, Dr. Philip Wong's, uh, well, frustration, so to speak, kind of thing of, you know, the, the, the inability to access uh, some of these information for patients. And um, it's not only health data that we're talking about, I mean, uh, I had a good fortune of visiting Denmark uh, three years back uh, for part of my training. And uh, I was totally impressed by how the central database was able to kind of uh, literally characterize the patient outside of his body, meaning that, you know, you, you kind of can know enough of this person, social background, health background, you know, everything that is necessary for any form of health and social intervention kind of thing. Um, by 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 having that central database, uh, of course, of course, cultures between countries and you know, uh, levels of trust and also policies on data governance kind of thing could vary, and 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 we we do have our unique challenges on you know how much data can actually be shared, but uh, um, not only for academic purposes, but but more importantly for patient care, and uh, rightly rightly so because um you know. Healthcare medicine has improved and healthcare has grown complex. Many of our patients do need to move from provider to provider, specialist to specialist, um, for various conditions. All right, and even even in order for primary care to kind of uh, be the bedrock of their of healthcare for the individual, um, a certain amount of transparency in terms of the the amount the inf health and social information that we need to access um has to be expected. And um, um, when you're talking about, you know, beyond hospital to home, when you're very safe within the confines of a clinic or hospital, there's a good chance that you will probably have enough information for you to deliver care with. But once the patient is back out in the community, that's where it gets difficult. Because what do you do? How do you integrate care? How do you coordinate the care between persons, I mean, between providers for the same patient if you have absolutely no idea what the other person provider is doing. And uh, patients, as we know, much as they would like to, they would want to, you know, you to have as much information as necessary, but not all of them are, are capable of actually um, providing the information as and when necessary and in an accurate manner. And so, you know, some kind of conduit, be it a, you know, a central database or be it a card, needs to be in place for us to be able to safely manage patients across the board. Yeah, thanks. You, you have raised a couple of good points here, not just central data system, but also patient education, physician education and management and how does physicians actually work with this data and how do they look at this data? Me, uh, let's hear it from Baldur Johnson of how do they manage in their healthcare management tools about for, regarding this challenge? Well, so... Um, uh... Before I answer that question, uh, Monica, I'd like to bring up a couple of other points about the Nordic systems that I think is um, is interesting and, and, and maybe helps understand a little bit better how, why sharing data and sharing information between the different providers and the different actors and healthcare systems in the Nordics is maybe easier than in many other places. So first of all, in, in the Nordics, you have simple payment systems. So there is, there is a single provider or a single payer that pays for, for all health services or mostly all health services. The government is simply the, the payer for, for, for health services. And in many cases also, most cases also the provider. The second thing is that the Nordics, all of them, have a single patient identifier, which is uniform across um, the, the whole care continuum, essentially from cradle to grave. So that's another element which makes data sharing easier. That you can identify securely data based on, on a single patient identifier, which is, which is universal. The third thing is that trust in government is generally high in the Nordics. So that, that gives people confidence to share their data to their healthcare provider. And last, connectivity has been, has been uh, the Nordics are very early adopters of, of, of connectivity, of networks, um, connecting the different stakeholders and the different actors in the care system. 
Now, to your question about how do we share, how do we how do we protect data, how do we how do we make sure that data is secure? Um, obviously, there is there's a single element which is probably the most underestimated in any kind of IT security, any kind of data protection, which is the human factor. Um, we can apply technology to encrypt data, to make data secure from a, from a, from a, from a breachable perspective, but the human element is the most critical component. So awareness of, 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 of best practices of, of, of not sharing uh, sensitive uh, things like uh, just simple things like passwords are, are, are critical. So, so that's 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 a key element. But of course, we apply you know best of let's say breed state of the art types of technologies to make sure that data is securely stored, um, and also when data is moved, that that it's also done so done uh, in a secure way. So I hope that answers the question. It does, it does. Thank you for sharing that. And I think these are a few good insights uh, to know that, you know, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure without this in place, a centralized data system would be difficult without a single pay system, single patient identifier, which I think even Singapore has implemented and is doing well on that front. However, we did have few challenges in terms of cybersecurity in past few years where we did see some data breaches. And now I'm sure Singapore has placed more, uh, more, uh, more security task. Maybe Dr. Ivan could uh, help us uh, know if there. Let us know if there are any any information he can share on that aspect. Um, yes. Yeah, so so definitely. Um, not only not only in the in the area of uh, of managing patient data, but but in all the processes that we we have the IT processes uh, uh, programs that we employ in the public healthcare sector. Um, all those have been subject to great subject to greater scrutiny uh, for potential security issues. Um, I think the at, at the end of the day, Baldur is right to say that, you know, it, it's not just uh, a reliance on technology that, that we can we can safely say is good enough, you know, to protect our information. It's only also human behavior. And at the end of the day, also, we need to ask ourselves, you know, um, for the provider on the ground, how much data is too much and how much is too little. And um, finding that sweet spot, that balance for us to be able to manage uh, uh, our patient's needs uh, adequately is something that we have to ask ourselves. And, and I think individual um, institutions will have to calibrate um, the amount of information that they actually want to access. Yeah. In, in healthcare, data is definitely is a key for providing integrated healthcare services. But I guess as Baldur has rightly pointed, it's the human touch. Integrated care not only involves collecting data and analyzing it, but also inputting the right data at the right point. So even patients should be well educated about using those devices remotely in covid many of the devices we uh, there has been a huge focus on remote monitoring of health maybe baldur could you explain a little bit or highlight to us a little bit if uh, are there any a, any practices that you have or uh, in your software or in your tools where you educate patients about how do you use specific devices and maybe even dr philip fong can jump in to say, uh, to let us know how do they how do you deal with this challenge so there's there's um, in terms of patient education uh, we, we we are not a content provider uh, to to patients however there there are there are there are essentially two main elements that we provide in terms of making sure that healthcare is more effective, more efficient, and the patient is more engaged. And that is improved communications, that communications with both the patient as well as the care providers is as seamless and is as, um, let's say, uh, unambiguous as possible. And we do that essentially by applying messages uh, more than, than voice communications. 
And, and healthcare typically runs from synchronous communications, but such communications, voice communications can be ambiguous. They can be misunderstood. However, if you if you take that communi those communications and you put it into a written format, it's much, much more difficult to, to uh, misunderstand or, or to uh, misinterpret. Second main thing that we do is that we, uh, we apply tools and we provide tools that enhance, enhance collaboration between care providers. So promote things like situational awareness, uh, apply mobility. One of, one of the things that we see as we look at the state of health IT and we see the adoption of healthcare, yes, you know, we've been investing in electronic medical records, uh, which are kind of a foundational element. But uh, uh, we, we provide the, the tools that allow you to visualize, to better understand, and to better collaborate on care delivery. Dr. Philip, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's a very complex uh, issue, but um, I think several things that are important. One, you need to have a foundational, uh, like Boulder mentioned, a foundational center or core uh, where this data can be stored and, uh, you know, of course, uh, assessed as well by uh, carers uh, of those uh, patients. Now, if you were to look at everything and how we will integrate uh, all this together, I, I, I think there are several keywords. Uh, one is accessibility. So accessibility means uh, whether the patient can send the data. And secondly, whether uh, the, the, uh, the carer, uh, the hospital or the physician can receive the data and access that data. So the accessibility is a big issue now because of the barriers of uh, lockdown of COVID. So even simple tests is not easy to do. So there's a shift now uh, in terms of uh, some of the tests being done uh, uh, you know, through uh, other means. For example, you know your art test now, you can go and look for the art test, you upload the results and you get the results sent to a central call. So that, that is one uh, issue which uh, uh, I think technology has uh, really enhanced. But again, there are other issues that are involved. For example, some people don't know how to use the art kit. Some people don't know how to upload the data and, and, and so on. So that, that is one uh, issue that is, you know, I think uh, in this time, uh, you know, as the need arises, uh, the solutions will come. And the solutions come very quick, uh, as you have seen uh, in the COVID uh, situation. Now, the other thing that I think is very challenging is this uh, concept of connectivity, which is data connectivity. Uh, it's just one thing to upload the data somewhere, right? But uh, it's not so easy to allow a certain person to enter the data, a person who needs to see the data uh, to get that information and then uh, do something with that information. So be beyond just sending the data, who do you allow the permission to enter the data, uh, to get the data is also a, a very key uh, issue uh, that we have to look to address in the future. And we, just to remind everyone that all this, uh, you should think of it, you know, uh, it has to be done in the comfort of your uh, clinic or comfort in your home, because we don't have this option now, particularly in lockdown to move about, go to the hospital, give your results, do a scan, get the results uh, uploaded to the uh, EMR and so on. Now, the last thing I think uh, it, it's uh, very critical in uh, integrated care uh, is being able to then put all this information, the physician, uh, the decision maker, uh, what to do with the patient, and then to react uh, with all this information in a way that can be documented, right? So, you, you know, you can imagine when you see a patient, you now he'll come with a CT scan, an X-ray, an ECG, cardiac ultrasound, MRI, all his medications and so on, right? So even if you got your hand on that uh, data, how are you gonna you know, put it together and then make a management decision uh, with the patient on how you're gonna manage the patient in the future? So these uh, key issues, I think accessibility, um, connect, data connectivity and being able to react in a holistic manner to the patients uh, are, are gonna be the challenges uh, in the future. I think technology is going to be a, a, a sort of cornerstone of how we are going to solve these problems. Uh, of course, this has to be taken into account. There are various uh, other, you know, sort of uh, 
uh, factors that have to be accounted for. Like Boulder mentioned something very interesting, which I, I thought uh, in our dry run was of vested interests, right? So who has the key vested interests in each of these steps of how we react in the holistic care to the patient? Uh, it's also uh, uh, something we have to think about. And lastly, of course, as uh, uh, Erwin mentioned as well, there are human factors that are you know, involved and we do mention. So these are you know, key things that we should think about. Yeah, I, I totally agree that there have to be incentives aligned in a way that, you know, uh, even for doctors, as we say, the technology is advancing, uh, healthcare is advancing. Uh, why would a doctor invest their time in learning something new when his, he can do the same work with the old technology? Maybe, yeah, exactly, Riku, I was about to point at you. Why, how does Nordic team do it and, and how have they approached this challenge? Well, again, let me give an example. So just one approach to this question. So we do what we are rewarded for. So just an example from the Nordics, um, a Finnish company called Ninjat, they have been actually in Singapore several times with Nordic Innovation House, looking for partners and activities and opportunities here. So Ninjat has provided tele, uh, telemedicine or remote communication services. It, it's simple to use platform for different healthcare providers in the Nordics, mainly in Finland, but also in other countries. So, Finland's biggest private healthcare provider, when they took this remote consultation, packaging to use, really simple to use and so on, they thought that, hey, what can we do totally differently? So what they figured out that, hey, let's provide immediate service. Actually, I have used it myself because my occupational health provider provides this immediate service. I can take my mobile phone, open the app and immediately click there and next available doctor comes in less than seven seconds to meet with me, and then consultation is done. And these doctors, they are in a pool. First power user was doctor who was traveling a lot. Traveling a lot. He did lots of consultations in a taxi, in a bus, in an airport, uh, when he was able to be kind of uh, a little bit far away from other people. So, and there's a new, business logic there, so you are paid rather small for that short online session, but whenever you have free time, you can be there as a professional available and make some extra income. Just an example that we don't have to digitalize existing processes, we can innovate totally new approaches for different types of use cases and different types of parts of the pathways of the care or the whole end-to-end -end pathways. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Teleconsultation has made this possible for doctors to use their free time and consult even remotely. And that has been a big blessing during COVID. Riku, may, may, uh, since you have used this teleconsultation service, uh, I do have a personal question. Did you find the service effective or would you recommend that the doctors need to be trained differently to work with patients on a digital screen like they have been trained to work with patients in, in an in-person way but to, to be to speak to a patient of uh, on an online screen do you think there needs to be certain different approach in the education yes and no it's meeting so we have learned everybody has learned in the last two years yeah. how we can meet online and in some cases, like there was a study about psychiatric services in Finland, and that study was claiming that there's no difference in the outputs or outcomes if it's online or if it's uh, physical. So I, I personally, but actually my background happens to be in mid nineties, I was developing video conferencing software and so on. So I really believe in this remote consultation, but then you cannot do everything. Somebody mentioned already that you cannot do everything remotely. For example, my last experience that I just mentioned, I did in less than one minute, I even shared a picture of my head and advice was that you need to go to see a skin specialist who needs to use a scalpel. So I went to the Singapore National Skin Center because a small operation was needed. I didn't want to do it over remote connection myself under advice of the doctor. I had to go to see a specialist who did the small scalpel operation. But definitely, the answer to your question is that yes, 110%, everybody should learn how to use this effectively in cases where it can work well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Riku. Um, Dr. Ivan, would you like to add to that about physician education as you work very closely with doctors in Singapore? 
Um, yes, I mean, I mean, uh, to be fair, a lot of us did not grow up with such advanced technology, and um, you know, and and uh, uh, even less so to actually use them in a professional way. But I think the pandemic has actually forced most of us right, to to adopt it, like it or not. And uh, I'm happy to say that actually, as far as I know, most of us don't have a big issue with it. I think our level of discomfort comes in only when. When, when there are technical issues, for example, connection is poor, right? Uh, perhaps we, you know, there could be instances where we don't see the patient very clearly and somehow it's not a problem with our system, but, you know, kind of thing, perhaps the resolution is poor on the patient's side. And we, we do have some issues with patients, for example, who might conduct the con conversation in a very public place. And that, you know, kind of thing, um, it is an issue uh, for both their privacy as well as ours, right? Um, and uh, one last thing is really, actually, telecare has been around for quite a while. Uh, what we probably don't do enough of is also uh, within our institutions to actually afford telecare to one another, right? Um, teleconsultation interprofessionally. Right? That would definitely um, do patients a lot of good, uh, even within, say, one large institution, where you will be able to reach um, uh, uh, the person you need for timely advice uh, or, or co-sharing of uh, care decisions. Uh, and that is definitely something that we ought to continue working on even as we try to grapple with the various challenges of uh, direct patient care through teleconsultation. Yeah. Can, I just, can I just add something? Go I think, uh, yeah, in, in Singapore, you know, when we do uh, teleconsults, uh, uh, actually, Ministry of Health mandates that we physicians undertake a, a guidance, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, online, uh, it's called a survey, but basically you have to, uh, you know, pass the survey before you can uh, actually uh, conduct teleconsult. So there's quite a lot of training and it highlights a lot of the, you know, sort of fundamental principles, which uh, we don't really see. For example, you have to ensure that the patient is who or she uh, claims to be, uh, especially if you're going to prescribe medication, for example. So these are some things which I think the government has taken quite a lot of uh, interest into and uh, has helped our physicians to take it up. But even then, what I must say is that a lot of doctors are very stubborn and uh, including myself, right? It's very difficult to change your practice. Um, so, uh, you know, in both my old hospitals and uh, my new hospital, there's always been this thing where uh, some physicians always uh, insist that they want to see the patient in front of them. Uh, this is something I think we need to change, uh, you know, and I think that the pandemic has in a way sort of highlighted this uh, change as well. Now, the second thing is with teleconsult, uh, most uh, technology is, comes with just the teleconsult itself. That means it's like, a, you know, Zoom and a video conferencing. I, I think as a physician, it's quite difficult because, uh, you know, um, it, it, you don't have the, you know, background information of the patient and so on. So uh, one of the things that my current uh, institution has done is to try and integrate the teleconsult service into the EMR itself. So when you open the teleconsult, you have all the patient information in front of you as well on the compu computer so that you can do the consult. Uh, you can record it and document it uh, properly like in uh, any EMR, and then you can also prescribe medicine, uh, medicine and other tests and so on. So, I mean, again, it's just to highlight, you know, technology has advanced very, very quickly, uh, but there are barriers in adoption. And also there are uh, technical issues that, um, uh, we have to think about, but lastly, you know, uh, regulatory uh, 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 things that we have to consider as well. So uh, it, it's when you do a teleconsult, it's actually, uh, you know, a, a contractual agreement, uh, like a normal physical uh, patient uh, physician uh, consult. So, you know, we have to be able to do all the things that we do in a physical consult. Yes. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I, yeah, sorry, sorry. I just thought I just I just thought of something actually that just happened a, a few uh, uh, weeks ago when I was seeing a patient. It was quite interesting because um, the patient actually had a um, consultation uh, via tele uh, via teleconsultation with a, a previous doctor, and and he said he gave me feedback that he actually enjoyed it quite a bit because for once the doctor was actually looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, it occurred to me that even in the face-to-face -face consult, we can sometimes appear very 
distance and uh, you know preoccupied with keying the notes and we can't be looking at the patient and sometimes even find it hard to talk to the patient while we are actually doing the entry on the computer but with teleconsultation the all you need to do is to position the camera right in front of you right above your notes and as you are talking you can actually be typing and accessing information and to the patient on the screen i know on the other side you look like you are staring at, this, at at them all the time and, you know, very attentively listening to them. I mean, hopefully that is true, but, you know, at least visually it looks like that. And uh, well, yeah. that's one good thing that actually came out of it if you use technology properly. Yep, yep. So <clears throat> that brings me to my next question. Like teleconsultation has been, has picked up during COVID like nobody's business. And now what do you see in the future? Will this trend go on or will it not go on? I, uh, maybe Baldur can take. <laughs> Baldur, you have been quiet for some time. Well, so first of all, it's 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 very interesting how an external event or an external um, something in the environment has essentially enacted major change on health systems and care delivery. And uh, it tells us that that can be done because these technologies have actually been around for quite some time. Uh, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, I had the pleasure of visiting something called the Ontario Health uh, Telemedicine Network, which was a network of, of remote care type of services in the, in the province of Ontario in Canada. So it, this, this has been around for quite some time. The interesting thing about what's been happening is that it, I think it has um, sort of, there's, there's been this moment of epiphany across multiple health systems that technology can actually, in, in many ways, uh, change and even transform care services. So as a result of the pandemic, what we are seeing is that there's a gr much greater appetite to invest and to enact and try to implement uh, technology that supports new models of care. And I think that's 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 a very interesting development. And I think we 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 are probably, well, hopefully, uh, seeing a, kind of a new the dawn of a new era in terms of technology adoption in healthcare. Because healthcare, quite honestly, is has been has been a laggard uh, in in the adoption of of, of especially information technology, uh, primarily because of the absence of outside pressures. Healthcare typically does not have the competitive pressures of other industries, which essentially means that, you know, why change? <laughs> so, so I think that's, that's, the, that's the good news about, about the pandemic and about the things that have happened as a result of that. I, I think the other thing coming from, you know, the medical device uh, point of view, the other thing that we have to also recognize is that medical uh, devices and other, you know, now more and more so things like AI um, and software and hardware are all regulated. So there are regulatory cycles that occur. And the regulatory cycles uh, do change with time. Uh, and, you know, if, if, you're, if your company is very deep pocket, it doesn't matter so much because you can keep up with those regulatory changes and change it as the changes occur. But most of the time, most companies, uh, particularly those who are uh, startups and uh, innovative, they don't have that kind of, you know, sort of uh, uh, cash capacity to, uh, you know, keep uh, doing the regulatory uh, 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 cycles over and over again. So this is one thing which I think uh, causes medical technology to lag behind uh, other uh, sort of less human type of uh, technology. Yeah, I agree. Regularly, uh, healthcare itself in itself is very, very complex and it has got multiple faces, regulations and in-person visit and now technology is supporting it. Um, we, yes, Rico, please go ahead. Yes, and if I may add to this list also, it's the governance model. And then to make any big changes, usually the governance model has to be changed somehow. As an example, in Finland, we are just kind of doing the biggest ever change in our healthcare and social services, uh, because in the past, every city 
we have more than 200 municipalities. Every city has been responsible for these services for their population. And our city is, our 10th biggest city is 60,000 people. So we have lots of small cities. So now we are going to have a small number of health and social welfare districts, a little bit like Singapore, three districts here. Uh, so we are moving to a new model for governance and this enables lots of changes because without changing the big high level governance model, we cannot change any details because we have to change it in hundreds of places in the past. Going decentralized. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A session and I would like to take one. What's your take on the role of other types of care, like nutritional care and alternative medicines? For example, TCM, that is uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, acupuncture, chiropractic, in providing holistic care. Will we see greater adoption of such alternative medicine cares in the future? What do doctors think of these care systems? Dr. Ivan, would you like to go first? Well, um. I suppose there is always a role for 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 complementary medicine, uh, especially in the area of uh, you know wellness and uh, psychological as well as physiological well being. Uh, I must admit I don't really know a lot about you know complementary medicine per se, but I definitely have patients who use them regularly. Um, I think I think what 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 the the uh, the question really is about this, you know, when when we when we manage a patient or when we treat a patient, um, what exactly are we treating? You know, is it just a disease, or is it as a whole person? I suppose once we see that it is a person that we are treating, then you know, um, uh, the the role of these uh, are quite self explanatory as are other forms of social and psychological uh, support. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a quick answer to this, but I think, in terms of uh, you know integrating uh, care to, to 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 make sure that it's holistic, yes, definitely the wider access we have to information, the better it is. And if you know complementary medicine information can somehow be included, that will make our EMR so much more uh, so much richer. All right. Uh, and uh, yes, I look forward to the day when that can happen. Dr. Philip Wong, yeah. what's your opinion on that? Like you're a cardiologist. Yeah, so I, I've, you know, uh, as I increase in age, I've taken a more open uh, approach to this. I, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm trained in Western medicine, you know, um, but our, you know, core sort of training as a physician is do no harm to the patient, right? So if these um, other uh, uh, treatments do no particular harm to the patient, uh, and in fact, some of them, you know, feel actually better, uh, you know, mentally, I would say not, may, maybe not physically, right? But, you know, for example, acupuncture has been shown to actually uh, release all your good hormones and, and it actually helps, uh, you know, to relieve pain and so on. So, you know, I'm quite open to these uh, kind of therapies um, in so much as they don't do any harm. Uh, and also they address, I think, uh, another big issue that is part of the whole uh, uh, problem of the pandemic now, which is your mental health, right? So I think a lot of uh, patients feel very cooped up in the home. Uh, they can't go anywhere. They can't exercise and so on. So uh, I think we have to be a bit kinder uh, in the holistic approach to patients and don't insist so much that, you know, your treatment works the best. Uh, sometimes uh, listening to them is part of the whole uh, concept of holistic care for the patient. Thank you. That was a very nice point, listening to patients. Yeah, if I may comment on this a little bit, uh, Monica, because I have some personal experience with uh, what the question is about. So, so first of all, um, uh, health care uh, is, is today mostly, unfortunately, sick care. So we are, you know, health systems are typically addressing symptoms of disease, not necessarily the cause of disease. And, and, and lifestyle is, is Western lifestyle, Western uh, lifestyle choices are unfortunately detrimental to health. So, uh, so that, that's, I think if you look at it, that start to look at it that way and then ask the question, uh, are, are, are we missing something? Are we missing things like 
what what impact has food on your health as an example is medicine looking at at those things and i i, I would like to hear from these our distinguished panelists here that are medically trained including yourself how much have you studied the impact of food on 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 health and, and such so i think you know we we shouldn't dismiss things that are um let's say have been have been um practiced throughout the centuries such as chinese medicine and i i've seen i've seen that actually work uh, from a personal perspective uh for instance in pain management instead of instead of um using pharmaceuticals and chemicals to uh, address pain uh using acupuncture as an example to address pain i've seen that be be you know very effective So I I I'd love to hear from from some of you uh, or or the panel about what is your perspective on let's say the non-traditional view of medicine as it as it relates to lifestyle and such things and its impact on holistic care. I will like to direct it to Dr. Ivan and Dr. Philip. Uh I mean you want to <laughs> <laughs> I think Philip, you can take that. You can take this one first. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I do spend. You know, I'm in a cardiac space, right? And you know, all our cardiac uh, problems actually ar- arise from our uh, so-called lifestyle. It is a lot of lifestyle diseases that we have developed. Uh, it's getting worse. You know, uh, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure because of too much salt. You know, high cholesterol. These are all. lifestyle related the uh, diseases that have impacted uh, our health uh, and it's not just in the west uh, you know the highest incidences of heart disease actually occur in the asia pacific uh, and uh, it's this uh, you know just generally our human nature are wanting to consume more and more now the the the, the education of diet and uh, lifestyle i think is the cornerstone of uh, you know our treatment for cardiac disease uh, as a cardiologist you know uh and I, i you know even though you know the diagnosis of the patient you you have all the tests that are back uh, that have come back uh, in front of you you still have to think about you know uh, besides pharmaceutical what the other lifestyle modifications that you're going to ask the patient to do and nowadays because of the internet and because of you know uh, the ability to uh, track all this various information the, the patients actually come to you with all the articles in front of them and asking you to distinguish what is right and what is wrong in terms of the diet okay so more so than just you know <laughs> for us to be educated uh, there is now a whole lot of information that is out there and what is the truth and not the truth uh, it's really the difficulty i find now as a physician in trying to tell the patient what to do Uh, so I, I don't know whether I've answered the question. I actually uh, made the, you know, question even more difficult to answer. But that is the real issue we face now. Yes, we go. Please go ahead. Yes, if I might touch this also, I'm not a medical uh, professional, but I have an experience, a fresh experience of a new type of service. Again, my occupational health provider, they have taken a new innovative solution into their portfolio. This solution is actually. It's been used in research also by ASTAR and NUS and others in Singapore in the past. So it's biomarker kind of um, MRI testing of biomarkers, 230 biomarkers from blood sample. And then the new novel thing for consumers through healthcare providers is one number. My number is 71. Actually, it doesn't show that well. So 71 is my number. I want to have better number. This is based on medical research papers. what can be said based on all 230 biomarkers found from my blood and then what my occupational health provider is now providing is advice for what to eat more what to eat less how to sleep better uh, how to live better life so that i get my body into better condition based on all so called official medical understanding and this comes back to the quest original question that what about ayurvedic and other uh, kind of additional medical approaches and wellness approaches unfortunately these additional things nowadays i have to pay them some myself so my occupational health package doesn't include them uh insurance doesn't cover them or public health care system doesn't cover them so that's one thing that we are lacking so that's we might get lots of benefits from those but we have to pay it ourselves 
um if um baldur i would like to take a go on this on your question because i am a trained doctor and i i do believe in um in ayurveda and chinese tra- traditional chinese medicine and other and acupuncture and that's not because i have seen them work because i believe there's a science behind it they have been here for centuries and there's a science and when people are trained in these degrees they are trained for years not for 3 or 4 but 6 7 years they have been trained into this so i definitely believe as how we have science for allopathy there is a science and they similar they study similar books they study anatomy psychology only the medicine the way they treat the patient is different so of course those medicines are like are, are, are on similar levels for me at least for me as compared to allopathy there are no way substandard or there are no alternative they are as equal it's just what you choose for yourself how you are going to get treated yeah you, so you, i fully you, agree actually monica so i i think um uh that was a point that i also wanted to make that you know the we respect these systems of uh of help believe because you know kind of there is a certain science behind it and and they have been tried through the centuries um and and many of them actually very um aptly uh, uh, uh arise from the principle of homeostasis really you know the concept of balance we may call it different things in different cultures and different languages but um even in western science and western medicine we are increasingly recognizing the need for this balance and and it is not foreign to us in uh, who are trained in western medicine to 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 not advise things like lifestyle modification dietary changes uh, it's just the way we look for evidence and perhaps the way we um uh, prescribe treatment uh we tend to be very targeted you bring up one problem we will give you a medicine for that problem you bring up another problem and we will we will look into some other solution for that problem i suppose that is why we have so many specialties right because each each um each organ in the body deserves our full attention however one thing we tend to forget sometimes is the right balance and sometimes you may not have the answer to everything but if you have an answer to something uh, in the right proportion that might be better than actually treating only one thing very well yeah Balu, you you have any last comments? Yeah. So so one thing I found, um, you know, treating patients during this COVID period is uh, a very simple, very simple applications, uh, you know, for tracking your own uh, vital signs, right? So this this before COVID was never done, but now everybody is, you know, uh, when they go and exercise, it's only them and the handphone. There's nobody else with them, right? So. the 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 tendency to input data into a tracker of some form uh, has increased quite substantially uh, over this covid period uh, and this is something which we never had the uh, you know great opportunity to do uh, pre covid so you know previously what we used to do is give them a diary or give them a booklet and ask them to record it down but they would come back with uh, very few uh, readings but now you know with trackers that remind you to put in those data points your weight you know your your blood pressure and so on you know the data is very much complete so what i'm trying to say is uh, you know there is technology uh, and for physicians uh, one of the things that we are missing very much uh, it's your uh, vital signs or parameters outside the hospital so in, in the hospital we have all your records in the emr everything but that's only perhaps 0.01% of uh, the time that you are you know uh, in front of us but the rest of the time we don't know what is happening to yourself so these trackers have become i think or trend you know sort of uh, markers have become uh, very very useful for physicians to help manage your condition so i know much more about your uh, as someone mentioned before right we are trying to build what we we call a digital persona of your medical self uh, a digital image in your electronic health records for example so with this image we have only dots and pieces because we only know certain parts but if we have more information we can get a better image of what your you know sort of uh, uh, illnesses are and we can of course manage that much better Yeah, I think Monica. I mean, the I think the key word here is is empowerment and education, and and ultimately, we each individual has to take more responsibility for their health, and and we've seen 
recently, for instance, the power of social media when it comes to the democratic process. So one of the one of the things that comes to mind in terms of how can how can governments, how can let's say the, the key stakeholders help is to leverage the different channels that are available to, to promote health and to empower people to take more responsibility for their health. Uh, the, the, the availability of technology is abundant. There is an enormous now uh, variety of different types of technologies that you as an individual can use and is easily accessible. For instance, a friend of mine which recently suffered a heart attack he could actually see on his um, his watch the the, the conditions that, that ultimately Go led to his, his his heart attack. So so empowerment, education are, are really key, and I think those things are underestimated, and the opportunities to educate are also uh, un- underutilized. Yeah, maybe just to add on, I think at the end of the day, you know, we always think about healthcare as being a provider of service. But, you know, perhaps, you know, healthcare increasingly has to be seen as an enabler to, to, to health. So, you know, that, that kind of fulfills our vision of, you know, beyond hospital to health. And um, really, at the end of the day, the power lies with people, so to speak. Yeah, sure. Riku, any last comments at your end? Yes, to kind of summarize what we have discussed here, I'm kind of thinking about cooperation. So we need more and more cooperation between all different types of parties, especially individuals who might become patients, but hopefully we can do preventive actions with them and then healthcare providers, technology providers, governmental bodies and such. So we need more and more collaboration to be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for an amazing and insightful session. Thank you, audience, for being so engaged in uh, patient with us. And in summarizing today's session, there are few key points that I would like to take back as uh, for future of integrated care, that data is at the core. We need that data holistically. We need that data uh, in a systemic manner and reliable data in a central ecosystem where the physicians can use it. And obviously, it's ultimately at humans are at the end receiving and inputting end. So uh, if we do our part, I think the system will work for an integrated care. And in addition to that, few other points mentioned here are collaboration between different stakeholders, payers, providers, and patients. Payers could be government insurance bodies and providers are healthcare doctors and allied staff and everybody who treats the patient, including even the uh, alternative medicine like Chinese TCM, Ayurvedic acupuncture, and lastly, being aware and empower uh, and known of your own condition, taking responsibility of your own health as a patient would provide us a holistic integrated care. And I would like to conclude today's session and I would like to pass it back to Jodi from SG Innovate team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for moderating the session as well as nicely wrapping up um, what was discussed today on behalf of SG Innovate as well as now the Innovation House. We would like to thank all of our panelists. Um, thank you to Monica, Philip, Alder, as well as Owen um, and Riku for joining us for today's um, fantastic discussion, as well as for the to the attendees for staying um, throughout our webinar. And we hope you enjoyed the discussion um, as much as I think all of us did. Um, please also keep a lookout for our post-event EDM, which will include more information, such as our YouTube event recording of today's webinar, so you can share it with the network who happened to miss today's session. Um, and we do hope to see you again at future events at SG Innovate. Um, thank you so much, and please have a great evening, morning, or afternoon from wherever you're tuning from. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, babe. Thank you. Bye.